All right, now in Acts chapter 17, I'm going to be focusing in on the, the kind of the first part of this chapter. If you want to start, we're going to, I know we just read the whole thing, but let's jump back to verse number 5. And before we even get started reading, I just, want, I just like to, to mention this. You know, the book of Acts is my favorite book in the entire Bible. This is the, when we first started the church, our, our Bible study, I started off in the book of Acts, my favorite book. And the reason why it's my favorite book is because it's so packed full of action. I mean, this is, this is where we see all of the action in the New Testament, right? This is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the apostles are going out, the disciples are going out, and they're literally turning the world upside down. I mean, they're going out, they're healing people, they're, they're preaching the gospel, and they're just, just spreading the word of God like a wildfire throughout the world. And it's exciting. It's an exciting book to see. I mean, they're getting thrown into prison. They're getting persecuted, but they're still going and they're bringing all these victories and God's taking care of them. And, and this, is, this is a book that I've, it's always touched my heart and just think, man, you know, I remember the first time, I've told this story before, I'm going to tell it again, when, when I went to, um, to, to Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, and I was talking to Pastor. I was just going for a few weeks, and I was kind of mentioning how much I love the book of Acts and just saying, man, I, lo I love this book. It's a great book, and it's my favorite book for, the, for all the reasons I just stated. And, and I said, wouldn't it be cool to have lived during that time and to see all these things happen? But what, what he said to me, he said, you know, uh, you know it would be great. And I said something like, it would be great to see these things happen again. And he says, well, there's no reason why they can't. There's no reason why we can't see God moving. God, it's the same God. God's looking for people to use to, to, to make his might known. God is just as, as, as active and alive today as he was back then. There's no reason why we can't, you know, dedicate ourselves to serving God and to being used of him and to see great works happen through the power of God. It's, it's, God is only limited by us. And, and, you know, that stuck with me all of these years later, all the way back from when, you know, I was real, real young in my, in my spirituality, in my faith, my walk with God, to now even pastoring. And it means so much the more every single day. And I believe and I know that we can do some great things, but, but people need to be dedicated to doing it. You need to be able to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Look, God is not, God's hand is not slack. God does not... Um, his, his power is, is just as powerful as it was way back then. And I know that we can do some great things today. But let's look at verse number 5 because we're going to see how, how these people, a lot of the people reacted. It actually was the, the, the unbelieving Jews and the Pharisees that, that were trying to stop this movement. They were trying to quench and, and stop the preaching of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Here, it's, they're, they're in Thessalonica. They go into the synagogue. And in, uh, in verse number 5 it says, But the Jews which believed not moved with envy. And see, that, there's a reason right there. Why, why were they envious? Because these guys are getting a big crowd. These guys are starting to reach people. These guys are doing something. It's the real deal. And there's a lot of, a lot of people following and converting and, and getting involved in the process. And anytime you see you know, uh, a, a real movement, someone preaching the truth and, and a lot of people getting behind them, the, 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 the false teachers, the false prophets, they hate to see that and it makes them envious because all they, you know, they care about the love of money and they care about um, you know, other things. So they don't like seeing these crowds getting moved away from them unto people who are just preaching the truth. But anyways, here, the Jews, which believe not, verse number five, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. So they're stirring up the you know, problems. They're, they're going around and they're, they're spreading rumors. They're spreading lies about them. They're going around and just trying to get all the people angry and focused against what they're doing. And they're trying to get as many people as possible to turn away from them and to cause them just a bunch of problems. Look at verse number six. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. They say, these people, they're out there, they're turning the world upside down, they're causing all these problems. Now they're come here and they're causing more problems here. And they bring them to the rulers. 
right? They bring them to you. Basically, they arrest them and they bring them before the rulers of the city. It says in verse 7, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So now what do they do? They were arguing and they were trying to convince the people and the rulers that the religion of the disciples, right, what they were preaching from the word of God contradicted the politics of the nation. And this sounds very familiar. This is, there's, there's, this is going on even today. The, 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 the people that hate God, the people that hate the truth, are constantly trying to, to stop and to quench the spread of the gospel, the spread of the good news, the spread of the truth from God's word. And one of the ways they do that is they go to the government and they say, oh, what they're preaching, what they're teaching, you know, nowadays it's, it's hate speech. Right? It goes against the laws of our land. It's going against Caesar. It's going against the government. It's going against our establishment, what they're preaching. We need to put an end to this. We need to stop this. That's what happened in, in, uh, in Botswana. There was a small group of people that hated God that was fighting actively against the gospel from being preached and the gospel from being said. And just for, you know, just because I know there's some people in here that probably have no idea what's going on with that. When you saw in our prayer request, we had um, Faith Forward Baptist Church in there and um, the Botswana Church. We have a missionary that we were, we were going to be supporting, was Garrett Kirchway, who is moving to Botswana to marry, a, uh, uh, to marry his wife and to help get a, a church started there, do a lot of soul winning and help a, a church get planted in that nation. And um, try to break this down as easily as possible. There's a lot of things that have been going on. But um, just, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, Pastor Stephen Anderson, he's a pastor of Faith Forward Baptist Church. He's the one who sent me out to start the church up here. I went to that church for about seven years or eight years and uh, before moving up here. And um, he was banned. They were planning on going to South Africa to do a soul winning trip, to just go out and preach. It was a full day of, of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when they found out that he was coming, because the, you know, a lot of people freaked out. It's basically what, who it is. The people that freaked out was the sodomites. It's, a, it's the homosexuals because they don't like the statements that he's made in the past. They don't like the stand that he takes. They don't like that he preaches the word of God without, without watering it down and without censoring it. See, the, one of the big problems we have today in America is that preachers are getting afraid to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord. This is what the Bible says. And, and be able to teach that. Now look, we, we've gotten way too soft on sin. We've gotten way too soft on the things that God calls an abomination. It needs to be understood that this is what the Bible says. It's abomination. The Bible prescribed the death penalty to homosexuality. I mean, read Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. If a man lie with mankind, he lies with a woman. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. You know, they've committed abomination. Sorry, I, I misquoted that. But they... Um, it, it's, still, it's still just as bad of a sin as it's ever been. And to stand up and to say, look, this is God's righteous law. This is God's righteous judgment. This is the truth. This is, the way, this is what the Bible says. We're not going to hide that. We're not going to not preach that. We're not going to not touch on that. It's what the Bible says. And for that cause... People have been, you know, saying, oh, well, this goes against what our government says. This goes against Caesar, right? Just as we see here in Acts chapter 17. And there are, there are countries in this world, there are nations where even just reading those portions of the Old Testament or different portions of the Bible is illegal because it's considered to be hate speech. <laughs> it's illegal. You get thrown in jail for it. And this is where the United States is headed, my friends. When, when there's a lack of people with, the, with, with the, the nerve to stand up and say, this is what the Bible says, this is what the Bible teaches, and we're going to stand by it because we love God's word, and we're going to preach it from the housetops. But this is what happened. Now, I've heard a lot of criticism lately, because here, 
ultimately, they were banned from South Africa, so they said, fine, not that big of a deal. They kind of changed their plans. They're still going forward with, with establishing this church in Botswana. Botswana is just north of South Africa. It's a, you know, it's a neighboring country. They got there. Everything was going great. You know, the people, that the, they said the fields were just wide on the harvest. I mean, people were getting saved left and right. Was, they ended up, I think the total numbers, the last I heard, was around 250 people ended up getting saved. Huge amount of people. I mean, I mean, great, a great reception. People just open to hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, open to, to, to receiving him as your Savior. A lot of the people there were real friendly. They knew who he was because he'd been in the news and stuff just in the area for, for the South Africa stuff. And they didn't care. They liked him. He said people were trying to get their picture taken with him and stuff. And, and you know, the people were not there hating him. But what happened was, you have this small group, you have this, the people that hate God and want to stop the work of God going to the public officials, going to these people and talking in their ear and, and you know, what, whatever it is that they go to them with, threatening or whatever, trying to get the people in an uproar, trying to get the, the government turned against them. And they succeeded in that so that um, Pastor Anderson was deported from Botswana so was Garrett Kirchway, who was going to be, you know, kind of heading up the church down there. And a couple other people as well also got arrested and deported. Now, I've heard a lot of criticism regarding this because people have said, oh, wow, it's great. All these people are getting saved. But why did you have to make such a, you know, why did you have to be so vocal about what you're doing? Why did you have to, you know, publish all this stuff on the internet? Why do you have to go and do the radio talk shows? Because what ended up happening is Pastor Anderson went to a, uh, an interview. He was asked, he was invited to do an interview on a radio show, just a local news station, a local radio program. Hey, will you do this interview? Sure, why not, right? Why not be able to get, get an opportunity to preach God's word and to have an audience over a radio program? Makes sense. So he does that, and, and they didn't like what he was saying. And of course, he didn't determine what they were going to talk about. The radio you know, host and, and other people kept on bringing up the subject of homosexuality. See, this is the thing, is that you know, <laughs> the one thing that we get criticized the most for, it's like, we don't even bring it up that much. People think like, oh, you know, they see you in the news, they say, oh, why are you always about this? Why are you always got to talk about homosexuality? Why are you? We don't. Other people keep bringing it up, and then... You know, you're forced to talk about it when people just continue to ask you the questions and keep bringing it up. I mean, that's fine. I'm not gonna gonna not answer someone when they ask something. But that wasn't the goal of what they were doing. It wasn't to go. You know, that wasn't on their radar at all. They were going to win souls and to set up a church. That was the plan. But you know, people kept asking him, so they answered. You know, scripturally out of the Bible what he believed, and for that reason, got deported. So. I've heard a lot of criticism lately. I kind of want to answer a little bit of that criticism. People saying how unwise it was to say anything about the homos in hopes that the church would not be shut down. People thinking that, oh, well, you shouldn't have even said anything about that. Oh, why do you have to be so vocal? Oh, why do you have to say things the way that you do? Why can't you just, you know, be a little bit quieter about it so that way you can still have the church there and you could continue to reach these people? And see, it's a, it's a little bit of a lapse in reasoning because... You know, criticizing the publicity, and, and I, I mean, I've heard criticizing just about anything you could think of. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 3. But what they're saying is you could have done so much more. Because the trip was a success. I mean, when you get 250 people saved, it's a success. When you, when you get that many people, you know, saved, and, and, and you know, it, it's a huge success. But not only that, when you get to the opportunity... To, to, to get the publicity as far as being on a radio show, getting in the newspapers, and preaching God's word. Because that's what he's doing. You know, he wasn't lifting up himself. He wasn't saying, oh, look at me, look at me. I'm doing all this great stuff. He kept on preaching God's word. And if you listen to the interviews, if you look at the thing, what, what, are, they, what are they condemning him about? It's God's word. It's, it's what the Bible says. Now, to say that, oh, he could have done so much more if he would have just kept his mouth shut is ridiculous. Because, well, let's just look at Luke chapter 3. We're going to see John the Baptist. We're going to see an example of John the Baptist. Is there a need for people's souls to get saved? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Is that very important? Yes, it is. But isn't there also a need to be calling out wickedness? Isn't there also a need to be just proclaiming God's word in, in, in all different aspects of God's word to the world that just that people could understand that there are Christians out there that believe in God's word that's going to stand on God's word no matter what that means? Doesn't that, isn't that also an important statement to make, especially when the news of that can go worldwide? When you face confrontation, you face persecution, and you could face affliction, and then get the message out to way more people even than just that one local region. Isn't that kind of important? But even besides that, I, want, I would like anyone to show me where does the Bible ever condone trimming the message, not talking about God's Word, in order to, to just the overall betterment, right? It, it, the Bible never says that. The Bible never says to withhold or to, or to, to, not, to not speak God's Word. Look at, look at John the Baptist. We're going to see an example here. Luke chapter 3, we're going to start reading in verse number 7. The Bible reads, Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath of come? But they just wanted to be baptized. Why would you call them out like that? Why would you say those mean things, John the Baptist? Why would you say generation of vipers? Why, why would you call them out like that? Can't you just be a little bit nicer, a little bit kinder? Among them that are born of women are not risen a greater than John the Baptist. That's what Jesus said of John the Baptist. But we live in such a, such a, a weak, watered-down culture today that's just going to say, oh, you can't offend anybody. Look, it's God's Word. John the Baptist was preaching the Word of God right here. It's recorded in Luke chapter 3 for us. Oh, generation of vipers, he called them out. He called out the wickedness in his day. Verse number 8, Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answereth and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation... And all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will throughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable." And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. John, in his, minister, in his ministry, he's preaching all these various things. People are asking him questions. Well, what should we do about this? What should we do? What should we do? He's giving them an answer. He's giving them a biblical answer. Well, don't do violence to people. Don't, don't steal from people. Don't exact any more from them. He's giving them all of these answers when they come to him with questions. And he's telling them exactly the way it is. He's not holding anything back. He's not watering down the message. But look at verse number 18 or verse number 19. It says, But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. John had a great work going. He had a great ministry going. He had a lot of people following, a lot of people saved, a lot of people baptized. He was doing a great work for the Lord. But what happened? He reproved Herod. Why? Because he married Herodias. It was his brother's wife who then we assume got divorced, and he ended up marrying his brother's wife. And that was wicked. It was something he shouldn't have done. And you know what John the Baptist did? He called him out for it. He told him that he was wicked. And what's interesting here, you get that same account in the other Gospels, but in Luke chapter 3, the reason why I chose this chapter, is because it also adds and for all the evils which Herod had done. It wasn't just even for that one thing. They, that was a big thing. That was kind of a, a big thing in the eyes of all the people. That was just public knowledge that Herod did this wickedness, and John the Baptist called him out for it. 
Now you could say, well, Herod was just some, some wicked, worldly king. You know, why don't you just leave him be and just continue to get souls saved? Why do you have to call it out? Because sometimes wickedness needs to be called out for what it is, and the people need to gain their understanding that this is wrong. This is not what God teaches, and, and it's wickedness. And, and the teaching needs to be out there. It needs to be made public, and a man of God needs to be able to stand up and say, that's wrong, no matter what the consequences are. You say, oh, he should, but, but he wouldn't have gone to prison if he didn't preach that. He could have gotten more people saved by not being in prison. By holding back on the message, by not preaching God's word. See, that's when people end up using their own wisdom, thinking that they know more than what God's will is. Okay, God, God had a plan for John the Baptist. I don't think John the Baptist strayed from God's plan when he got arrested because he preached against Herod. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 6. Yet today, people want to condemn pastors or other men of God for, for, for preaching out against homosexuality or preaching out against any other hot-button issue that's out there today because they'll say, oh, yeah, if you do that, you know, they'll say, oh, he shouldn't have got, they got arrested and deported. If he would have stayed, he could have done a lot more. Well, what about John the Baptist? He could have done a lot more, too, if he didn't get arrested. What about Stephen? Look at Acts chapter 6. Thank you. We're going to see who he's talking to real quick because what he ended up doing, the, uh, the martyr Stephen, great man of God. It says he was full of the Holy Ghost, did all kinds of miracles and wonders. He, he, he got a lot of people saved, was doing a great work for God. And what happened to him? He got stoned to death. Right? And in Acts chapter 7, there's that whole chapter is dedicated to him just kind of preaching against the, uh, the Jews at that time, the unbelieving Jews. And we're going to see who he's specifically talking to in Acts 6, verse number 9. It says, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with, with Stephen. So there's people from all over the place, the Libertines, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, Cilicia, Asia, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. They couldn't, you know, Jesus, Stephen is talking, he's preaching, he's full of the Holy Ghost, and they can't resist it. They can't do anything. They can't say anything against him because he's preaching the word of God, and God's truth and his word cannot be spoken against ultimately. I mean, you can speak against it, but it's not going to get you anywhere, and they could realize that they were losing the fight. They were losing the battle because what Stephen was saying just was, was too wise. He had too much wisdom. Verse 11, it says, Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council so what do they do they have to lie about him just like they lied about Jesus Christ so he preaches this long sermon go, go to Acts chapter 7 Acts chapter 7 verse 51 He goes through kind of the history of, of Israel and goes through a lot of stuff and they're listening to him, they're listening to him, they're listening to him and he's talking about how the prophets have come and gone and then in verse 51, he starts pointing to them and calling them out and calling them out for their own wickedness and, and it gets to the point to where they can't take it anymore. Look at verse number 51. Bari ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. So he calls out these unbelieving Jews and says, you know what? You have betrayed the just one, the Christ. You betrayed him and you've murdered him who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looking up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet 
whose name was Saul. They killed him. They couldn't take it anymore. They just put their, their hands over their ears and just like, no, you know, and just, and just could not handle what he was saying anymore. But you look at the life of Stephen and say, Stephen was young. Stephen was just getting started in his ministry. He was doing all these great things. Why did he have to call them out for that? Why did he have to, to call them murderers? Why did he have to, to get them to the point where they're going to get so angry at him? Stephen was preaching the truth. He was preaching the word of God. He was preaching what was right. And see, this is the attitude that we need to have that we're going to do and we're going to say, we're going to preach the right things regardless of what people are going to do or what they're going to think. When you, you look at, you know, do this later, you can look at the book of Jeremiah in chapter 1. Look at Ezekiel chapter 2 and chapter 3. And God is, is instructing his prophets and saying, I have a message for you to preach. I'm going to give you the words to preach. You are going to preach exactly what I tell you to preach. And he says, don't worry about their faces. Don't look at what the, the, you know, the faces that they're going to make at you. Don't worry about the things they're going to say. Don't even worry about if they're going to accept it or not. He says, they're not going to accept it because they're a rebellious house. But you better not be rebellious. You better do what I'm telling you to do and preach my words. And don't hold back. Don't add anything to it. Don't subtract anything from it. Just preach what I tell you to preach. Preach God's word. And that's what they did. And that's what all the great men of God do is they preach what God says to do, regardless of the outcome. Hey, we don't have to worry about what man can do unto us. We need to worry about what God can do unto us. And that's exactly what Stephen did. He didn't, he didn't have to call him out. He could have just kept going on and winning souls. But what he did was right. And another thing to point out here, because this isn't hidden here by accident, in verse number 58, when it says that they stoned him, it says, And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. The young man Saul later went on to become the Apostle Paul. I, I, I believe this firmly, that what Stephen ended up doing there by sacrificing his life by preaching what was right, by not making any compromising positions, but just preaching the word of God, that young man saw that made an impact on him. He saw what happened. Now, at the time, he was consenting unto his death. But after he got saved, after he got converted, that moment was still in his, in his mind. And I believe that was a pivotal moment for him and critical for him to understand you know, how real this is and, and helped him then to go on to become one of, one of the greatest men that's probably ever lived, that, it, that has done so much for the Lord. I think that was important. I think that was, that was instrumental in, in Saul becoming who he became. See, our lives, it's not all about us. It's the exact opposite. It's about other people, being a minister, being able, there to help other people. Now, Stephen is standing up for the Lord he ended up sacrificing his own life, I think, to help in the Apostle Paul's life. He didn't even know it at the time. He was just doing what he knew he was supposed to be doing, preaching God's word, you know, not backing down. And without his own knowledge, ended up having such an impact on other people. What about the lives now in Botswana that people can see, hey, these guys aren't backing down. Everybody else that you see in the media, anytime anybody ever comes out against the homosexual crowd, they always end up retracting. They always say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't mean that. Why? Because it hurts their pocketbook. Because they get attacked. Because they get scared. Because they get pressured into losing their job or whatever else is. You see the celebrities doing it. You see it all the time. People saying what they actually believe and then having to apologize and say, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't mean that. Because they're about to get destroyed. But when you see a man of God saying, you know what? No, I'm not going to back down. I'm not, I'm not recanting on what I said. I believe it. It's still wicked. It's still a sin. And you can do whatever you want to me because I believe in the word of God. That has an impact on people. When people see integrity, when they see the truth, when they see someone who's not afraid and just saying, you know what? I'm standing on God's word. It means a lot to them. It has an impact. I know it did on me. For a long time, I was out of church 
because I was sick of just seeing hypocrites. I was sick of, of seeing someone preaching one thing. You, you know, we'd read a passage and then never touch on the things that, that are controversial, never touch on the things that might offend somebody. And, you know, nobody in the church really doing much of anything. I got sick of it and it was boring and it was, you know, what it seemed to me just kind of kind of useless. Until I got to a church where I could see someone that not only preached the Bible, not only believed it, but lived it. That is inspiring. When people can see you doing the things that you actually say and believe in, that makes an impact on people's life. Yes, they were only there for a short period of time. Yes, they got kicked out. Yes, they got deported. Yes, they got arrested. But how many people did they reach? What other young men's lives now in that region? A fire might be kindled. A fire might be sparked. And they could continue on in their own region, in their area. We don't know that. But see, the people that want to be critics, that just want to criticize everything that's being done, are just going to continue to spout off their mouth. This is the same type of people that like to criticize the soul winning efforts. You know, we go out and we knock on doors and we preach the gospel to every creature and then there's, you know, the people that aren't doing anything, the people that don't do that, they want to criticize them. Oh, you should be saying this. Oh, you should be doing that. And want to criticize everything that you do while they do nothing. They're not doing anything, but they want to criticize the work that you're doing. Oh, you could be doing this part. You could be doing that. Why don't you go out and do it? Okay, at least we're doing something. I'm not saying that we're perfect. I'm not saying that Stephen Anderson's perfect. I'm not saying that any of us is perfect and that we just know everything and everything that we do is always right. But you know what? All the people I've heard criticizing about what they're doing in Africa, I don't see them making trips out to Africa. I don't see them sending people up and training them to go out and start churches. They're not doing it. But they want to tell everyone else how bad of a job that this guy's doing it. Why don't you put in the resources? Why don't you take the time to go out and do a trip like that? If you think it's so wrong, why don't you just go and do it right? And I'm, you know, I'm hearing this from other believers, other born again believers. Go ahead and do it then. We're all on the same team. You don't need just to criticize the work that other people are doing. But I think oftentimes it's criticism out of envy. Because they see a real movement. They see a lot of people's lives being changed. They see a, lot, a, a big following. They see people who, are, who, are, who want to follow someone who's actually preaching the truth, who's actually not afraid to just say what the Bible says. And they're envious of it because they don't have a spine themselves. Yes, the, the door was opened in, up in Botswana, and then now it seems like it's closed. But they used the time that they had. And when they're out there and preaching the gospel and winning souls of Christ, you know what they're doing? They're walking in the Spirit. And when you're preaching God's Word, you're preaching God's Word in the Spirit. And I believe that's what happened. And you know what? I think what happened there, and, and, and the, the way things happened was according to God's will. We may not be able to see all the ramifications and all the lives that have been touched personally right now, but we, can't, we cannot censor the message. We can't hold back because of fear of what someone might do or getting arrested or anything. Like, look, the disciples, the book of Acts, start reading the book of Acts and show me where any of them at any point ever censored the message because they were afraid of being arrested. They were afraid of being kicked out of a country. It didn't happen. They stood on God's word boldly. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 28. I'm going to read for you from Acts chapter 20, verse 25. The Bible reads, And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. This is Apostle Paul speaking. Why is he pure from the blood of all men? For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I haven't withheld anything. Apostle Paul said, hey, I'm free from the blood of, you know, from, from all men's hands. You know, the blood's free from my hands. I have preached all of God's word unto you. I have preached everything. I haven't held anything back from you. 
I've given you the truth. It's up to you to decide what you're going to do with it. My job is to be the messenger. My job is to show you this is what God says. This is what the Bible says. That is his job. And he says, I have, an, I have not shunned. I have not held that back. And he didn't. Apostle Paul is a great example of this. And you could read about how many times he's been beaten and stoned and imprisoned and shipwrecked and, and, and all the perils and all the dangers that he faced for the word of God's sake. Matthew 28 is where Jesus gives that great commission. And I just preached on this the other, a couple weeks ago. Look at Matthew 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The Great Commission, go out, teach all nations. So you go out to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, which means, obviously, they've got to get saved first, so you're preaching the gospel. But you're teaching all nations, not just the gospel. He says, teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's part of the great commission of going out. Yes, you're preaching the gospel. Yes, get them baptized. But teach the nations all things. It's not just about the gospel. You need to preach everything. We need to preach it all. We need to teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Well, let's go back in Matthew. Go back to chapter 5. He said to teach everything he's commanded him. Okay, well, let's look at some of the things that Jesus said. Let's look at some of the things that Jesus commanded in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, real famous for the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are they, blessed are they, all, all the different blessings. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Look at verse number 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye... When men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Did he say if men start to persecute you, don't preach on, on certain subjects? Did they say when that starts to No, he says, you're blessed. Hey, when people are coming against you and they're lying about you and they're persecuting you because you're preaching God's word, Rejoice. Leap for joy in that day. Count it all gladness because you've got some great rewards in heaven. Because you're not backing down to the persecution, to the opposition that you're facing by preaching God's word. Verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his saber, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Your job is to be preserving. You're the salt. You lose that saltness. You lose that savor. He says you're good for nothing. We are here to preserve. We are here to preach God's word. We are here to be a light. Verse 14, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. He's saying you're a light. Let the light shine. The light from God's Word. Jesus Christ is the light. We need to, Jesus Christ is also the Word. We need to preach and proclaim God's Word. We need to let this light shine before men. Out in the open, out in the public, not hidden, not secret, not underground, not, oh, we're going to say one thing in the church, but a different thing to the world. Look, we're just going to lay it all out there because it's God's word and it, and it needs to go out everywhere. Verse 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets as is commonly taught today. Jesus Christ did not come to destroy the law or the prophets. You say, yeah, but we're free in Christ. Yes, we are. We're free in Christ. We're free from the curse of the law. We're free from the, from the bondage of sin. We're free from that body. But sin still exists. The law is still there. The law is still a schoolmaster to lead people to Christ. Amen. But God still wants us to obey the law. Even as born-again believers. He didn't destroy the law. He fulfilled it. But it's not just God. It's not like, well, there's no such thing as sin anymore because, because Jesus Christ got rid of the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. 
So without the law, there could be no sin if there were no law. But is there still sin? You better believe there's still sin. Jesus Christ did not come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. If Jesus Christ is telling us this, don't you think we ought to be preaching the law then also if he's saying he didn't destroy the law? I mean, it all needs to be preached. Now, we're not preaching that you need to follow the law to be saved because that's a works-based salvation. That's a false gospel. Faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. But we still preach the law because it's important. It's still part of God's word. It's still something that we ought to be looking to and following and understanding. Look at... Um, he says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of the le these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Do and teach what? The law. The commandments. The Great Commission, Jesus Christ said to go out and to teach all nations, baptizing them. And to teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. This is from the mouth of Jesus Christ. He commanded them. That he did not come to destroy the law. And he says that you're going to be called great in the kingdom of heaven when you do and teach them. It needs to be, it needs to be taught. Don't tell me that you need to not preach those things. Because you might get kicked out. Because you might get arrested. Last place I return. Look at Matthew chapter 10. What was happening in the book of Acts, the world was being turned upside down. What, I mean, think about that. Being turned upside down, it was turned on its head. All kinds of things were going on. It, there was a status quo that was going along a certain way for a while. But now all of a sudden, these guys came and everything's just, just you know, people are believing all kinds of different things and, and changing their mind and changing what they believe is what's going on by the world is being turned upside down. All kinds of things are going into, into chaos, right? Why? Because... There's opposition to the wickedness. There's opposition to the evil agenda that just kept going the way that it was going. Now, all of a sudden, people are pushing back the other way and it turned the world upside down. If we want to turn the world upside down today, it's not going to be turned upside down by holding back. It's not going to be turned upside down by withholding the parts of the Bible that people don't want to hear. It's the, it's the parts that people don't want to hear is what's going to turn the world upside down. The things that people agree with you're not turning anything upside down. Everything needs to be preached. Matthew chapter 10, look at verse 24. Again, the words of Jesus. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? He's saying... They called the master of the house the devil, Beelzebub. And that's Jesus. That's what they said about Jesus. How much more shall they call them of his household? Yet, the people that are the critics that want to criticize, nobody's calling them the devil. Nobody's calling them the things that they called Jesus. Why? Because they're not walking in the footsteps of Jesus. They're not standing up for God's word. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. Look at this. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. Make God's word known. Hey, preach it from the housetop. Let's let everybody know what God's word says. We're not going to hold anything back. You know what? Some people are going to get upset. Some people are going to call you names. Some people are going to say you're of the devil. You'll be in good company because those things they did, all those things they did to Jesus Christ and to his prophets and to the disciples. That's what happened when you preach from the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't fear what man can do unto you. And this is a very, because what the enemy tries to do, they try to make you afraid. Satan wants you afraid today. He wants you to think that you can't talk about religion with people. He wants you to think that you can't actually say in our society anymore today that you think homosexuality is wrong. He doesn't want you to think those things. He doesn't want you to say those things. 
Why? Because when you say things, you might actually have an impact on somebody else. So he wants you afraid. He wants you not to talk about it. Not to say anything about it. Just go along and get along. And you could have your own personal beliefs inside. You better not dare make it public. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, preach it from the, from the housetops. Let's be bold. Let's preach from the housetops. Let's let our candle shine bright. This is why we broadcast our message on the internet. This is why we record and we upload this stuff because let's just, let's just let everybody know as many as possible. Let's use whatever avenue we can. If we could ever get on you know, any time on a, on a TV station or on a radio station or whatever it is where we could just reach people, hey, let's preach God's word to the, to the maximum audience as possible. Let's just get the, the message out there. We're not ashamed of God's word. We're not ashamed of Jesus Christ. And we're not ashamed of what we believe. Anyone that gets mad anyways, they're not getting mad at you. They're getting mad at the Bible. They're getting mad at God. Let's be good messengers of God's word and not hold back his message to the people. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for the great examples that we have in the Bible of men of God that stood up in the face of adversity, dear Lord. And that I pray that you please help us to gain courage and gain strength by reading about these people who, who counted their own lives as nothing, dear Lord, that, that they might um, be pleasing to you and to just preach your word, dear God. And there's a lot of impact that we can have when, um, in people's lives just by preaching the, you know, the, the, the words that we use. And your words especially, dear Lord, are powerful. Help us to have the boldness and strength to preach your word, dear Lord, and not to be scared and not to be worried about what the enemy can do to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.